Hey, this is Roz Rezebeck on The Rock Stop with Chris Contra. Welcome into The Rock Stop. Chris Contra here. My guest tonight has fronted the band's Negative Trend as well as Theater of Sheep. This is Roz Rezebeck. How's it going, Roz? Hey, it's going great. Great to be with you and um, get this interview knocked out. Sounds great, man. So let me just ask you uh, right off the bat here, before you became a, uh, a punk rocker, what were some of your early music tastes growing up? Oh, gosh. I had, like, some of the worst musical taste and some of the best musical taste. I liked uh, uh, a lot of early Bowie, Lou Reed, Neil Young, side. Oh, New York Dolls, of course. Yeah. I had a friend named Dee Dee, and we were downtown killing time, getting in trouble, as teenagers do. And we went into a record store called Long Hair Music, where Michael Gilmore worked. Michael Gilmore, who began there and went on to write a book about his brother, Gary Gilmore, the serial killer, got a job at Rolling Stone and now is still uh, a Rolling Stone contributing editor and has written several books. But we went in and we said, what's good? You know, what's good, Michael? And he says, oh, man, you kids are going to love this. And he gave us a copy of the Ramones. Yes. Because uh, Dee Dee was named Dee Dee. Oh, Dee Dee Ramone. So Dee Dee was a girl in my circle of friends. So I went home with this circle of friends known as the Possumettes, and we had gotten this Ramones record, and it was the first punk rock record ever, and we went home and we got a pint, uh, not a pint, we got a fifth of vodka and a gallon jug of lemonade and dumped some of the lemonade out and then dumped the vodka in. And we started blasting that on my stereo. And, I mean, it was, it was Lou Reed times 10. I mean, it was... It was just it was just something new and you know, and it was wow, if these guys can do this with a fuzz box on the guitar, the whole kind of idea dawned on everybody, gee, maybe we should start a band, you know, because we certainly weren't digging, you know, listening to Toto and yeah. Journey and going to these big Coliseums festival seating and Right, getting well, you know, having a real crappy time. <laughs> but the Ramones is just what really turned on everybody, you know, everybody over there. The Clash, every one of the bands that came through San Francisco, all of them idolized the Ramones. It was the Ramones were were it, you know. Definitely. Did you ever get a chance to uh, see any of those early Ramones shows? When they came through Portland, yeah, I saw, I saw them when they came through before Portland. They came through, uh, they played at the Olympic Hotel Ballroom up in Seattle. In the Olympic Hotel, the ballroom. If you can imagine that, yeah, there's like 500 punks inside the lobby of the hotel. Um, I don't know how they did it by their booking people there. <laughs> And all these punks in there drinking like, you know, Thunderbird and sitting in line all day getting drunk and whatnot. And I was one of those people. And um, I think that was their first Northwest appearance. And um, it was just, it was just mind blowing. The hotel people were crapping their pants, but. <laughs> Yeah, I could imagine that must have been an incredible, uh, incredible moment for you. And when did you say, you know, I got to be in a band after, uh, after seeing that? Yeah, I I ran with the circle of um, friends, um, and I moved out at a very young age. I moved out at fifteen, 
and I got a night job cleaning Portland's at the time only three strip clubs. There was the Chelsea one and the Chelsea two and uh, the Tomcat, which was the gay strip one. There's a few porno places, but they were all owned by the same people too. But I got a horrible job, you know, janitor there. But anyway, I met three stripper chicks that I formed lifelong bonds with, Debbie Sue, and then Pam, who just died uh, recently here, and Jane, who died a long time ago. But I moved to San Francisco with three strippers, and they kept saying, you should be in a band. You look like you'd be good in a band, you know? So I kind of lived with them in Portland, Oregon on 23rd Avenue when 23rd Avenue was kind of just a a sketchy dump, you know, it it, it was musicians, prostitutes and uh, students, you know, on student loans or whatever, you know, and then they moved over to Flandora behind Thriftway and, it was not bad at all. It was 185 no, it was $85 for a uh, studio apartment. And the crazy part was, you know, being young and young, 15, 16, and deciding I'm going to be in a band, I had a bunch of guys come over with amplifiers that we scraped and borrowed and, you know, we sat up and none of us could play for a lick. <laughs> And we set up and we were (laughs) burst and uh, I was evicted like day. Wow. It's kind of crazy. But then they were going, man, Portland, you know, we did one show in Portland, which was Portland's, uh, it was called Portland Punk Explosion. And it was Portland's first punk show and it was also the mentor I don't know if you know them the mentors oh yeah I know the mentors yeah it it was the mentors first show before they had gotten so weird <laughs> um, the three of them wore get this they wore Rick Derringer album covers on their heads <laughs> like Instead of the hoods, yeah. they had these Rick Derringer album covers on their heads, which fit on their heads, believe it or not. Wow. And the other amazing part is I didn't even know Rick Derringer made three albums. <laughs> right. You know, Hang On Floofy. Pardon me, I'm, I'm lighting a cigarette here. Oh, okay. I was going to ask, was that before um, um, El Duce was in the band? No, El Duce was in the band from oh, the very wow. beginning. Okay. Yeah. Nope, I got to go around the corner here. There's kids, and I'm smoking pot. <laughs> Portland, huh? Yeah, well, I try and be nice. I'm around my shop. How it's, is how's the music scene in Portland these days? Uh, it's the same. It's it's really good, actually. Hipsters from all over the country are moving here, and you know, yeah, doing their band thing here. So. So it's it's so it's alive, you know, yeah. It's alive, yeah. Kids, you know, think they're like so wild now, and well, I guess they are wild in that they take all these drugs they order over the internet and whatnot. But <laughs> I um, think I, I think mean, if these I, kids would have seen back in the, <laughs> the, the rock days when you were playing, I think they'd be quite uh, shocked by you know thinking that they're wild now. For one time, one. You know, after one show, uh, there's this girl, and Bruce Connor sent me a picture of her. He's this famous photographer. I just got a got a thing. I'm going to be in the Smithsonian too. I'm in the Museum of Modern Art in Berkeley. I'm in the Museum of Modern Art in um, what is it, uh, Bingham University or some places? They are wanting permission to. Uh, show a uh, Bruce Connor picture of me. Hell yeah, I'll give me permission. That's kind of neat. Yeah, absolutely. But I was going to say the one, hey lady, here's some bottles. Oh. Thank you. 
Oh, these people just got in the wreck here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I live over there, and then this is my shop. I'm in an interview right now, so I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. so this one time after a show, this crazy girl, Bruce Connor showed, sent me a picture of her years later. We go in and it's just madness backstage, just complete madness. And I don't know what made us like so groovy, except for the sex pistols. You know, we're demanding that we play on the show with them or they're not going to play the San Francisco show. And so they're doing interviews about it on the radio. And, and, you know, we're thinking, well, what the heck, you know, like us for, what what did we, what did we ever do? Yeah. Anyway, it was complete madness. And then backstage, this girl wants me to autograph her boob. She, Bust out a razor blade, and she wants me to autograph her boob with a razor blade. She wanted you to carve your name with a razor blade. Yeah, and I got as far as like R O, <laughs> really lightly, and I was like, I can't do this. Yeah, I can't do this, <laughs> and I still have dreams that like someday, some you know middle aged man is going to come and knock on my door and say. Are you Roz or Ro? <laughs> yeah. And just, but the stage diving and everything, I mean, I paid the price for oh, it. Yeah. You know, I've had 13 hip surgeries now. Wow, 13. Yeah, yeah. I, there's some heavy trauma in there. Well, I remember so, reading the book, uh, Give Me Something Better, about the Bay Area punk scene. And uh, Jello Biafra called you the most electrifying part of the band Negative Trend because of your wild stage antics. Yeah, you're yeah, probably, yeah. Ian McKay said something nice about me too. He said Roz was taking the lead singer, the role of lead singer, to a whole new level, and we would watch him, and and you know. And I was like, whoa, this all like kind of builds up my ego, <laughs> and then. <laughs> Until I get to the part about why did the Sex Pistols want negative trend on the bill? They went to Howie Klein and they said, what's the worst band in this town, Howie? And he said, oh, negative trend, hands down. <laughs> the singer, no, the, the guitar player is always out of tune. Uh, the bass player can't play the drummers in outer space and the <laughs> singer he's just fucking crazy he just dives around and he's just crazy yeah and he says that's who we want to open for us as a matter of fact we want them to headline for us so he was just being a prick and you know trying to you know piss him off or something yeah so that that was his motivation in that but for 30 years i thought the sex pistols think i'm really cool and they want me to open for their band you know <laughs> the, you know one of the funnier stories is where we were the opening act for the dills and the avengers who were two of my favorite bands so we get on and after about the second song I do a stage dive off a speaker stack. I think it's in my profile pictures on top of like two washing between stacks. And I jumped out and I landed on my elbow on this table, breaking this table with my elbow. And I had a broken arm. So I go out. It's obviously broken. There's so much pain. So yeah. I go out to General Hospital. Yes, it's really called General Hospital in San Francisco. <laughs> it's General Hospital. And I go out to General Hospital, <laughs> and they do an x-ray, and they go, yeah, you got a broken, you know, you got a broken arm. You got a hairline fracture in your uh, socket in the little round part there. Uh, we'll get you wrapped in a 
get you wrapped in an ace bandage and we'll send you down to the casting room and they'll get a cast on you just as soon as they can. Mm-hmm. So I got wrapped in this, you know, ace bandage and I got sent down to the casting room. I sit there about 10 minutes and 10 minutes when you're that young and, and just, we were just so full of energy. I mean, punk rock was like, just like this, yeah. It was just this ball of energy. It was just taking off. There was only like 150 punks in Portland. There was only maybe 250 or 350 in San Francisco. So to fill the house, you had to get every punk in San Francisco to go to the Mabuhe. Yeah. But anyway, where was I you, at? You, you broke your arm. They taped it up. And then oh, they said you had to wait arm, 10 they minutes. Taped it up. Yeah, and I think, well, shit, I'm gonna, I might miss, you know, the deals, but I don't want to miss the Avengers. I had a big crush on Penelope Avenger, <laughs> and so I thought, fuck, I'm not gonna wait here and get this casted. So yeah. I left the hospital without getting a cast, just with this. a broken arm, just taped ace. up. Yeah, just wrapped up with an ace bandage and then i ended up like making these homemade casts and <laughs> so i mean you were whatnot. still in pain and stuff I mean, you were in a lot of pain I yeah imagine. well they only gave me like four tylenol because of the way i looked oh yeah you know <laughs> they didn't want mohawk to and whatnot so four tylenol twos i'm not even gonna stay for the four tylenol twos they wouldn't even get me a buzz yeah right so I uh, I had to How? I I just decided I I had to yeah I know I had to I just had to go back to the club <laughs> and catch catch the Avengers set yeah yeah and then for months afterwards I made these like I got a plaster uh it on there and I kept wrapping ace bandages. Did on you, it and everything, but did you consider going got, back to the doctor or to the hospital, general uh, hospital? <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, until it was like in so much pain, I uh, when I came home for Christmas, I went to a doctor. Yeah. Uh, here in Portland, he goes, "Well, there's nothing really we can do for it now." You really. Know? So I've had to live with it for the rest of my life. Oh and, man. It, it just burns and hurts in there, you know. Wow. But it healed up somewhat because yeah. it was in the ball, you know. Right. It didn't really have anywhere to majorly dislocate. Yeah, thank goodness for that. Yeah. So when you formed Theater of Sheep, what was the thought process after coming off of Negative Trend? Theater of Sheep became, a, yeah, it was a really good band. Um, a lot of changes uh, Jimmy's guitar playing was just, you know, amazing. It was all like melody lines and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of like, uh, the edge in, in you too, you know, it was a lot of echoing, yeah. doo -doo, you know, right. uh, rhythm type thing. People call this post punk psychedelia or whatever other people compared us to echo and the bunny man and uh psychedelic furs yeah compared to them a lot what do you think of labels in general it, it's kind of misleading because you know every kind of music is is certainly a little bit different yeah. you know yeah and to say oh this is you know, the one that someone caught me with, they say, yeah, I like your music. It's a cross between shoegazer and and something or another kind of music. And I was like, shoegazer? <laughs> so I guess I am kind of like behind the times a little bit because I had never heard of shoegazer music. I, um, yeah, I just recently uh, heard that, uh, that expression as a label a band. I guess, um, yeah. yeah, where you kind of stand back and you kind of slouch your shoulders and stare at your feet. Yep, exactly. 
<laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of labels out there, but uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, the music is what uh, it matters. Whatever anybody wants to call it, you know, punk, new wave, whatever it's called. You yeah. Know. Well, the thing was is that that theater sheep is is very dark and it's it's very um punk rock in a way yeah. you know yeah as far as the lyrics are real dark and they're you know not your they're they're not happy and pop enough to be like uh boy george or you know some of the fluff bands adam ant and stuff and yet we kind of got compared to them regardless. And that was kind of an insult because, you know, we weren't at all like those bands. Hey, you're listening to Roz Rezebeck on The Rock Stop with Chris Contra. was after my first gig they said you should get a band together so i got a band together and we played this guy fred siegmuller's basement um fred siegmuller became a promoter who owned a club here called urban noise but anyway that night i went home with debbie sue pam and jane and uh another guy and about seven other girls and they threw some mattresses on the floor and it was like kind of a free for all orgy. And it was kind of like the second time I'd had sex. <laughs> so I'm like really, really freaked out, yeah. really, really freaked out. And some of the girls are like totally lesbian. And I was just like kind of concentrating on Pam because she, I really didn't know anything about sex. And I thought like once you had sex with a girl, you got married and you know, <laughs> yeah. that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And, but that night, you know, I still remember that we went to that apartment. They threw down a couple mattresses, put on a single of the Rolling Stones, dear doctor, please help me. I'm hurting. Mm -hmm. There's pain where there went to the heart and pulled the arm up on it. So it just played over and over all night long with this orgy after I'd done my first ever musical gig. Wow. It was in Fred's basement. And I was like, yeah, I want to be a musician. This is great. <laughs> yeah. But then around 7 a.m., it turned really nasty because this one dyke all of a sudden whips a gun out on me and says, you've been hogging Pam all night. Wow. And I thought Pam was my girlfriend, you know. Yeah. I didn't really want to touch any of the other girls, really. I never did anything with Debbie Sue, and her and I are still friends. She lives over in Holland. So this dyke pulls a gun and said, maybe we should have some girls' time, and you and Michael should have some bull time. <laughs> and so she makes me and this other dude get in the closet, and they close the door, and she pushes the couch up against the closet and then there's mattresses there so there we weren't getting in in this little closet yeah you know on our knees like facing each other scared as hell wow and we can hear outside the other girls were not into this too because all of a sudden you know wow what can break the mood of an orgy other than a gun yeah you know right and so she's going, come on, everybody, don't, don't ruin the party. And then, and then she was all coked out or something. And, um, uh, anyway, that was just one of those kind of crazy experiences with rock and roll <laughs> that I had. <laughs> and it was just absolutely nutcake. Yes. I, I saw you said you read the give me something better book. That's quite a book, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I like the style of it, you know, where they're talking, you know, between... Yeah, between different people in the scene. I like that a lot, yeah. Yeah, and I found out all this stuff, you know, about myself that I didn't know. First <laughs> of all, that we were the most horrible band in San Francisco. But 
also found out that like Bruce Luz and uh, Kat Bajeland and all these people autogra- or auditioned for uh, my job singing in Negative Trend, and they all got turned down, including Jella Biafra. Yeah. I, I was reading that in there, and I was like, wow. You know, <laughs> I was like, boy, they must have been aiming high. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't a good singer. Well, you know, it also you know? comes down to your uh, your on stage moves and things. I mean, you you are considered one of the uh, the more outrageous performers. I mean, you're definitely paying for it now physically with 13 hip surgeries. What provoked your stage moves, or was it just the music, and that's what happened to you? It was just the music, and it was. I just hated people just sitting down, you know, and being like just sitting in their chairs doing nothing. Yeah. You know? So I remember one one time grabbing Craig's guitar between, because um, two guys were playing like chess in the front row or, or in <laughs> at one of the tables. They're playing chess during a punk rock show. Oh, my God. So I grabbed his tape, his uh, guitar, and I went and I whacked that chess table off the <laughs> thing you know i just whacked it off and uh that was one of the reasons craig's guitar was never tuned i think that <laughs> probably did some damage to it you know it became like um we started to attract the trouble they were just like troubled loners right and you know they would it was attracted the weirdest crowd hey how you doing good my elderly neighbors they're like 80 year old yeah their house they have some good wine <laughs> they they know they're living uh, next door to a punk rocker yeah <laughs> they're okay with it yeah. they're actually really rich people and really old people are the most open-minded yeah i put the thing on really old people because people in the middle like 15s and 60s are generally more I don't know. Yeah. There's, it's going to be different now that we're all getting into our 50s and 60s. <laughs> we are in bad need of a rock and roll retirement home. <laughs> I mean, you know, what are we going to do? Where are we all going to go? I mean, although my friend told me, he says, hey, man, it's changing. People our age are getting old. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, you got to come out. So I go out and hang out with him because he's been one of my buddies. He gave me the advertising job of knowing him since I was 13. He's he's one of the people that like actually formed my musical taste. Oh, really? I, I, yeah, I was wearing a Kiss shirt or something at a bus stop. And he goes, you like Kiss? And he goes, I hate him. My mom thought, I love the kinks. My mom thought, this album was a Kinks album, so she bought it for me. Do you <laughs> want it? So we skipped a bus to go get the album from his house, and we ended up skipping school. And, you know, him saying, what do you see in these guys? Kiss, and he's playing Kinks songs for me. And anyway, we ended up being lifelong friends. Yeah. You know, ran into him in San Francisco when I was playing in a band, ran into him when I was popular up here and, and, uh, was nationally popular with theater sheep. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he got one of those places and he says, this could be the place. And it's like only, it's about half empty, you know, and it's just kind of run down. It reminds me of an amusement park or something like that. <laughs> an old run down amusement park. Yeah. But he's got like this great pad there and everything. And then we took the pathways to there's cabanas and a shuffleboard thing and a swimming pool, and nobody's in them. Nobody's in them. The only sound we hear at all is we're walking down one of the pathways and we hear Peter Frampton, do you, do you feel like we do? And I go, wow, <laughs> so that's what elderly is now, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because you have to be 55 to move in there. Yeah. So, so Peter you know, Frampton elderly the... P- Peter Frampton is music for the elderly now. Now we know. Peter now, Frampton. <laughs> you know, well, people that, you know, are my age, that, yeah. that, 
that was kind of have a you, big hit, that have, Frampton Comes Alive thing. Have you seen your musical taste change, or are you pretty much sticking with uh, what, you, what you loved growing up in your formative years, the teen years, your 20s? You know what? I really play night live a lot, uh-huh. and I watch bands, and I I, I kind of trust their taste. And I watch bands, and I'd say about 70% of them I hate, yep. especially the rap ones. Yeah, I agree. Um, um, but, you know, there's there's new talent all over the place. And the neat thing that, you know, I kind of feel regretful about is if they had this do-it-yourself and Pro Tools and and the scaffolding, all the little record companies and stuff, if they had that, you know, back when I was breaking big, so to speak, um, you know, I think I had a chance of making it more into the big time and selling a lot more records. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, a lot of people look at punk rock ethics of, you know, I mean, people talk about punk rock ethics and how, how far it goes and what exactly it means. Do you think something like that, if that had been around, yeah, it could have helped you, you know, me- reach a higher amount of success, but do you think it would have been frowned upon because it's not as pure as uh, as the music you, get, you guys yeah, recorded? Yeah, that's what everybody says. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that, I'd be rich. (laughs) It's like, Roz, I love you because I think of you as like true, pure punk, and you never sold out. And if by never sold out, they mean never got rich. (laughs) They're absolutely right. I just had like a, a... I don't know, a sixth sense or something that, you know, if I, if I didn't find some way to extract myself from that woman, right? that it would be me putting the gun down my mouth, you know? I think, you know, you can't get away from her and then you're really in a, in a world of shit. So I can see what you're talking about. Yeah. I have all these letters I've kept when, uh, and why I kept them, I kept the answering machine tapes because I had a restraining order on her. Right. Um, and the police told me to keep the answering machine tapes where she's calling me and threatening me and whatnot. But I just don't think he was, she's a very, very intelligent person and she really knows how to push buttons. Yeah. And from what I understand, Kurt, like all us men, he, Courtney had a beautiful mind. She did. She had real intelligence and you could really hold a great conversation with her sometimes for 30 hours straight. Wow. Sometimes she's obnoxious and you'd want to stop the conversation in five minutes straight. Yeah. Kurt, like all us men, trapped it to leggy, beautiful models. Right. And those leggy, beautiful models were throwing themselves at him. Yeah. I mean, he was the hottest rock star in the world. And, you know, just how you said, well, don't you think, you know, people would think you are kind of selling out, you know, right. selling out or it wouldn't be pure if, if, if you, you know, became real commercialized. She applied that to him sexually. It's like, you just want to be with like some tall, leggy blonde. There's no substance to you at all, you know. Uh She, I heard her berate him backstage at a show in, uh, where was it? She was really drunk and she was with some lesbian girlfriend or bisexual girlfriend. And, uh, she, you know, was berating him that you just want some long legged blonde, blah, blah, blah. And it was familiar to me because she had left answering machine tapes on my answering machine. And one of them we even sampled and made 
a song out of me and Rob O'Hearn for Missing Persons. Uh-huh. We sampled it. But, you know, it's like, you're just going to, you just want a big titted blonde. You want a big titted blonde and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, and, and made him feel bad, really, really bad for having, he had a couple of dalliances, but she made him feel like dirty and bad for being attracted to what all us men are attracted to. Exactly. I mean, yeah, you know, that's yeah. And she was able to inspire such hatred of himself. You know, I am no different than other people. Yeah. I am attracted to women just on, you know, looks alone. I do objectify women. You know, she, she got him. I just feel like I had a little more strength than him that. Right. He just didn't have, he was chronically depressed and I just don't think he had the strength to strand up to her. I mean, for me to get completely rid of her and, and we were in touch, oh gosh, just, it's been less than a couple years. Oh, it's been that recent. Yeah. And she got mad at me. I think she was feeling me out because she's got this idea that she wants me to write a book about her, but she gets to, like, redact whatever she wants. That's the deal. Yeah. Redact or take out whatever she wants, which is not the and, true. Which is not the true story. I mean, she's going to make it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, there was only one real thing that she wanted to take out. That I was like, no, I'm not going to take that out. That's part of the story. Yeah. Um, Do- and I think it's more a case of she wants people to like her. Yeah. She wants people to love her. She, you know, yeah. she wants that, and it's just it's it's crazy. Yeah, it's become a point where it's not about money. It's about, I mean, is it a power trip? What do you think it is? I mean, is she just a, such a manipulator? You know, I don't know. I know she's not as bad of a person as most people think. Point think she is. She's had a rough childhood. And her father, Hank Harrison. I mean, I remember he, he. I remember he used to go around telling people that uh, or suggesting that she may have had a hand in Kurt's death. Yeah, that's what she. That's, that's what, what people say about her, but I disagree because after he died, she came down to my apartment in San Francisco and stayed there with my wife. It was my first year anniversary and I hadn't quite told my wife about that aspect of my life yet. So Mm. (laughs) (laughs) it was a little bit embarrassing or awkward, but, um, I could imagine just, yeah, but just spending in the paparazzi and all that, but just spending that time with her, um, I'm no expert or nothing, but I don't think she killed her husband. I think she loved her husband very much. She just and had she him. would do just anything to hold on to him. Mm-hmm. But I don't think she would murder him to hold on to him because that would not hold on to him. Right. You know? Yeah. She just had such an overbearing um, way with him to, to maybe not... I don't even know if she would realize how overbearing she would be and how bad she would make him feel like you were saying earlier yeah yeah she could yeah she just could wind people into a mission i mean yeah i just realized i wasn't gonna hold up to this woman she wanted me to be a rock star more than i wanted to be a rock star really that makes any sense do you think it was because she wanted she wanted fame for herself, and the only way she could uh, achieve it would be through somebody that she was close with becoming a rock star? 
through a male because, yeah, she thought it was a male-dominated world as far as rock music. But then she, you know, came up with this idea of girls doing it for themselves. And yeah. she had, I have a couple rehearsal v- tapes. Um, she had a bunch of terrible bands. What were they? Uh, Pagan Babies. Babes in Toyland, no, Babes in Toyland was something different. Pagan Babies, uh, all these different names and from a fanzine. I have review of Faith No More, first gig at the Mabuhe Gardens. And it said the band was horrible. The one shining thing about the band was the singer who came out in a white flowing wedding dress and was blah, 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 you know, the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking, who did Courtney screw to get this <laughs> review? It, it had to be somebody, you know. Yeah. Yeah. She was, had some sort of a relationship or. Yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. I have to agree on that. Uh, Faith No More clearly didn't hang on to her for a long time. If she was so great, I don't know why uh, they would have got rid of her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, she said on the stream she takes me. It's like, um, well, if you want somebody like that, I forget what it is, a big tirade. Then if you want somebody like that, Reza Beck, you're just going to have to go find yourself some big, Titted blonde, and we sampled that because it's really kind of ironic. She went and made herself a big titted blonde. Right. I think the term she used was, "You're going to have to go find yourself some big titted blonde with a perfect little nose." And I thought, "Huh, yeah, yeah." She kind of go went and did that. Yeah. 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 Pretty much fit. <laughs> <laughs> so you think she was always like projecting? That's what she she envisioned herself as, or wanting to be. Uh, yeah. She you saw know, herself. As- I mean, she she got a weird start in in music, and I think it with her dad it started with her dad. Her dad, and I. She's on the back of one of the Grateful Dead album covers. If you look at the back of the one album cover, there's a bunch of, looks like a bunch of hippies, family, girls, boys, men, little Mm -hmm. boys, little girls in diapers, all up under this tree. Um, And Courtney is one of the kids in the picture. Yeah. And... Hank Harrison, he went out as their tour manager, ostensibly. Actually, he was their LSD dealer. (laughs) He's always been heavily involved in dealing LSD. Yeah. Um, And left Courtney with, like, some groupie at the commune who gave her, like, LSD on her cornflakes. Wow. Like every morning, which made Courtney extremely enlightened and self-actualized, but it also did a lot of damage. Yeah. Like when she was at my house and um, I would go to light a splee for a, a joint and she would run over to the window and open the window and, and start fanning her face because she got extreme flashbacks and wow. problems uh, from the smell of pot. Yeah. Would, would, you know, do these flashbacks. So she never had it easy coming up. No. I mean, I know, I know her probably better than anyone alive today, I would think. Safe for the book, but, you know, because my publisher told me, we're not paying you $100,000 to tell your story in a bar or to people who contact you on the internet. But I may die any moment, and it's 
some things that need to be known. And, and some of them are positive. Yeah, some of them are negative. Yeah. I don't think she killed her husband. She had a lot of negative stuff happen in her life. And and here's one that's like bound to fuck any girl up. She lo- And I was at the same concert. So we're hanging out at my house, you know, uh, laying around. And she's going through my little uh, memorabilia and ticket stubs of concerts I went to and stuff like that. And uh, she sees this. KGON is our big radio station here in town um, for Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And um, she sees a uh, Ted Nugent. Uh, like a fly memorial call. Oh. Yeah, well, no, it was just the, it was just the button from it. Okay, I had the button in, and it says, uh, you know, Ted Nugent rocks the Coliseum. Uh, what is the date? You know, February fourteenth. Yeah, and she sees that, and she starts bawling. And I've never seen Courtney be weak. I've never seen Courtney ball. Well, I, that's not untrue. She balled for about four days straight when Kurt died. Mm-hmm. But I had never seen her show such emotion like like sadness and Kurt and just just this really in a bad way. Right. So I'm trying to comfort her and I'm, what's going on? You know, what's, what, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. And she goes, he took my virginity and he was such a pig and, um, blah, 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 blah that night. So we were both at the same concert. I was about 16. Courtney was like 13. Wow. And uh, Ted Nugent screwed her. Mm-hmm. She wasn't a good-looking girl. He was just into young stuff. Wow. Or whatever. Yeah. And she wanted to be a groupie, but she would have been, let's see, she's born in 64. She would have been 12. Wow. And she lost her virginity to Ted Nugent. And I believe so. And yeah, what a creep. Yeah. That guy is a kind of a creep. I mean. And so even know, seeing, so when she sees anything Ted Nugent, she uh, has a pretty bad reaction to it, I'd imagine. Yeah. But at the time, you know, she was. Yeah. She was just mixed up. She was know? just. She was real mixed up. And everything came to her. She just came too- from a real mixed up family. But, um, you know, she. She, she didn't have it all easy, and no. so I'm not going to regret her now that she's got, you know, hold against her. But mm-hmm. I get so many people, like, I friend them now because I'm, I'll am i hear what they have to say. But there are just an immense amount of, like, Kirk Free. They have Kirk on their profile picture they send me friend request look through my friends sometimes yeah there's like 50 or 75 that are like obsessed with kurt cobain and this murder and my thought on it is you know courtney's not a role model she's absolutely obnoxious mm-hmm. if there was any way for the fbi or the police to bring her down, if there was a shred of evidence, they would go after her. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I, I really just don't think she killed him. Just, just seeing, she was in a, a real state of sorrow. You know. Right. I don't know. You know, either that or she's the greatest actor in the world. Yeah. Actress in the Act, world. Right. Did, when she. Uh... She became an actress. I mean, very uh, famous. I, I, I was su- pretty surprised when uh, I started seeing her pop up in A- A-list movies. What did you think about some of that? Uh, I didn't ever watch any of her movies. 
Really? I really even haven't fully saw through the one I'm in. 